All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our panel session. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch or are still enjoying the lunch. Today, uh, we have the panel session titled Towards a Model of Faculty Development, Writing That Colors the Ivory Tower. And we have with us Dr. Stephanie Sanders, Christine, Dr. Christine Berger, Dr. Jewel Shepard, and Dr. Kiresti Wilder Bonar. I will just give you, an, give you an overview of the session. ODU's Office of Institutional Equity and Diversity, in collaboration with the Faculty Writing Studio, began the faculty writing group to foster accountability, benchmarking, and improved academic writing skills for faculty of color which, who wish to increase and sustain writing productivity. This group of scholars meets to write, discuss progress, and share challenges and effective writing practices. The panelists will discuss logistics, lessons learned, and outcome measures. Without further ado, I will uh, request uh, Dr. Sanders to start the session. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. All right, uh, my name is Stephanie Sanders, and I am the Associate Director for Diversity Initiatives here at Old Dominion University. And I also chair the President's Task Force for Inclusive Excellence. And we'd like to welcome you to our session today, uh, talking a little bit about faculty uh, development and uh, the development of community. And the name of our presentation is uh, Towards a Model of Faculty Development, Writing That Colors the Ivory Tower. And uh, this term, uh, the Ivory Tower, is oftentimes used in the academy. Um, and sometimes it can have a negative, uh, kind of a pejorative connotation to it. Uh, because it indicates that uh, sometimes we that are in the ivory tower, we can disconnect whenever we wish to as intellectuals from really what goes on in uh, the tower. Uh, but today, through this lens, our presentation is going to talk a little bit about the experiences of faculty of color, of underrepresented or minorities, um, and their experience within the academy. And so I'd like to yield the floor right now to my colleagues to introduce themselves, and then we will uh, get on with the presentation. Hi, I'm Dr. Christine Berger, Assistant Professor in um, Counseling and Human Services in the College of Education. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jewel Goodman Shepherd. I'm a Visiting Assistant Professor in the School of Community and Environmental Health in the College of Health Sciences. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Kedisi Wilder Bonner in Sociology and Criminal Justice in African American and African Studies. Okay, so uh, we wish to be timely with our presentation, uh, and so this is an overview, a tower overview of, of our time together on this afternoon. Um, and we'll, we're first going to begin with an interactive kind of icebreaker, so we want it to be interactive. Uh, this looks kind of formal with the big screen and the panel, but it's really <laughs> going to be informal, uh, I hope. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the literature review, what the literature says about some of the challenges that faculty of color are faced with. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how the writing group was formed at ODU, look at some of the demographics of our own campus community, uh, and then talk about some of the lessons learned, what we learned from uh, forming this group, um, how community uh, was important to us, and how we kind of supported each other emotionally as well. Um, and then we'll hear from our panelists. I like to call these tips or theory into practice. You know, I'll talk from the, from the head and talk about the literature uh, but it's really my colleagues who made the experience really enjoyable. And so we'll bridge kind of that theory into practice and we'll hear some of their narrative a little later on. We'll talk about the implications and then we'll allow time for questions and answers and then I'll make a few closing statements. So our learning objectives for this afternoon are really quite simple. Uh, we'd like to explain uh, the writing group, how it came into existence, um, and, and we wanted to look at a structure, at a self-sustaining structure uh, that fosters fa faculty diversity or development and also success. And some of the ways, i.e., in the academy or in the Ivory Tower, that success could be defined as through the tenure and promotion process. So uh, looking at scholarship, looking at research, and looking at uh, teaching. And also the second half is to generate interest in reproducing similar writing uh, models. We understand that um, just because we, we came together and, and a replication of this group may look very different in, across the institution and in different uh, disciplines. So we'd like to generate interest as well and disseminate the information and the lessons learned that we learned from forming this writing group. So how many faculty members do we have in the room? Okay, good. Okay. 
I just wanted to poll the audience. So um, as new, fa I'm not sure if you're new or seasoned faculty mm -hmm. members, uh, but, but sometimes trying to balance and understand and navigate the ivory tower uh, as it relates to research um, service and teaching can be a, a daunting task. And the exchange of knowledge becomes very critical um, during, this, during this time. And so one of the ways that we built our community was through an exchange of knowledge. And conocimiento, which is a Spanish word meaning uh, knowledge. So we're going to demonstrate and kind of illustrate really quickly how we build our community. And the, the image that you see there, the torchbearer, this is just an image. Um, it's actually displayed at the Chrysler Museum of the Arts in toward downtown Norfolk. And this is an image of uh, um, a male or could be a female that's mounted on a stallion. So he looks very robust. Uh, he has a lot of energy and he's reaching down and he is grabbing a torch uh, from one of his comrades who has fallen. Um, and sometimes this is how we feel in the academy. So this indicates the passing on of knowledge. And this is exactly what we did within our community that we built. Uh, but it took some time. We were together for almost a nine months. Mm -hmm. So now we're ready to give birth now. So this is, <laughs> this, this is what we're doing here. We're pushing hard, right? <laughs> we're pushing hard. So um, I'd like for you all to just pair up um, with the person next to you or someone close to you and answer uh, one of three of these prompts in, in, in 30 seconds. Uh, so I'd like for you to share an effective tip that fosters a consistent writing schedule and we'll switch in 30 seconds. And so just please feel free to answer one of three of these writing prompts. Okay, go. Maybe he can join me. Okay, switch. Okay, so we can, we'll go to the next one. Um, if you could share a barrier that may create difficulty with writing consistency, so about 30 seconds, and then we'll switch again. If we could switch. And finally, if we can discuss how you balance teaching research and service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds like us. <laughs> That's the question. Mm -hmm.
Okay, if we could switch. Okay, now that we've exchanged some of the, uh, some of the knowledge that we have as, as faculty, uh, what was an effective tip? Does anyone mind sharing out? I, I feel a little bit like an imposer right now because I'm not really being very effective in writing, mm -hmm. but my effective tip, I do a lot better when I actually schedule time on the calendar and I set goals and make a list and say these are my deadlines whether the deadline is real or not, but I set it on my calendar. Right, mm -hmm. good. It's good visual. Does anyone else want to share an effective tip that fosters consistent writing? I have yet to really uh, do it fully, so I don't really know how effective it is, but it's been advised to me to do just, even if you only did 20, 30 minutes a day. If you do 20, 30 minutes every day, that's much more effective than, you know, feeling like I have to have a five hour block or I can't do anything. So, and for many people that has been very successful. Good, thanks for sharing that. What about uh, a barrier that creates difficulty with writing consistently? Does anyone want to share that? <laughs> yeah. I, I think other uh, responsibilities that we have in our lives, especially our work responsibilities that have more immediate time frames that are due dates or whatever, um, because writing seems to always be the last on my list of to do things because of deadlines. Right. Right. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, anyone else? One more barrier? My, my biggest barrier I found is just stopping, staying still long enough to, you know, settle down, sit down, focus, mm -hmm. rather than moving around and, and, you know, flitting from activity to activity or whatever. Writing really requires lack of movement on my part, so that's, mm -hmm. that's tough. I like that, settle yeah. down, sit down, and focus. I wrote that one. <laughs> so, okay, uh, does anyone want to share how you balance uh, teaching, service, and research? <laughs> right. <laughs> this is the conocimiento, the exchange of this knowledge that we're... Okay. So we're all works in progress. Yeah. So we're, Exactly. So th this is the point, that we are all works in progress. And I think uh, we have so much intellectual capital uh, from Berto's concept of capital to exchange even within this room. And so we spent almost a, nine months together. And so we were able to exchange some of the tips. And I think that um, the intellectual capital that we have, it shouldn't be taken for granted because it does a couple of things. It creates community, a kind of self-efficacy and a sense of belonging for those who may be new to the academy or new to the ivory tower. Uh, it demystifies the tenure and promotion process, which we found out within our group differs across colleges, even within departments, uh, de depending upon sometimes what layer of identity you have. You could have, it could be gender, it could be race and ethnicity. Some of those things are explicitly taught and some are implicitly taught. So we are socialized into the ivory tower, so to speak. And then uh, to exchange knowledge, it minimizes assumptions and misunderstandings. And I always like to say, sometimes what we don't know can hurt us mm -hmm. in the process of, of tenure and promotion. Finally, the exchange of this knowledge, it supports navigation and awareness of the academic culture. Each culture, each, each um, so um, each department, each college has its own culture. So to try to navigate that sometimes can be tough. So this is what that exchange of information, that conocimiento, this is exactly uh, what it does and what we, how we have been able to build that community for the past nine months. 
So we'll go right into the literature review, and this won't be extensive. This is really to just kind of give us a context of uh, where we're coming from. Uh, so for faculty diversity, out of all of the diversity and inclusion initiatives that higher education uh, tries to, to undertake, whether it's uh, student diversity, curricular, co-curricular, or engagement, faculty diversity is by far the most difficult uh, for administrators and for institutions, colleges to, to really tackle. Um, despite years of you know looking at policies and procedures with affirmative action and so forth and so on, it's just really difficult uh, to kind of grapple with and, and understand the recruitment, the retention, and also the success. Uh, and as you can see in 2007, full-time instructional faculty, according to the U.S. Department of Education, uh, we were about 18.2 percent. Um, and in 2011, those numbers didn't move very much, maybe 2.5 uh, percent in uh, 2011. And so I think uh, with these stagnant numbers, um, as, as some of the research says, it's, uh, it's important that we take a critical and a closer look at the recruitment, the retention, and the success of, of faculty, uh, whether we want to give the name minority, underrepresented, uh, faculty of color. So I still kind of grapple uh, with those names a bit. Um, but I think it's important that we take a critical look um, at what this population is doing and how we can support them. So. Um, a study by Turner, Gonzalez, and Woods, uh, they looked over 20 years of literature and they looked, um, they came up with some emerging trends related to the retention, success, and also the dissatisfaction of a faculty of color in the ivory tower or in the academy. And this is what they, what they came up with. So uh, as far as the retention and success, uh, many people enter into teaching uh, service with research because they love teaching. This is something that uh, I, I think innate and also mentorship. So if you have first generation college students, uh, we also go into the academy. So I don't, I don't know if there's a term called first generation faculty. Maybe we should add <laughs> that. But we have a lot of first generation yeah. college students. So sometimes we just kind of matriculate and go right into the ivory uh, tower, try to peep it out and see what's going on in there. Mm -hmm. Some of the dissatisfaction uh, related to the retention success and dissatisfaction of, of faculty include ex accent discrimination, you'd be surprised, linguistic diversity. Um, oftentimes there's an intelligence quotient that goes along with that, which mm -hmm. is unfortunate, but it's true. Um, intellectual contribution, sometimes women, uh, faculty members of color, LGBT faculty, they're challenged in the classroom. What are you offering to this ivory um, tower? The credentials are, are challenged. Um, and sometimes there's a lack of balance. You know, there's an overcommitment of service requirements according to the literature with women and people of color. Um, so again, who runs interference for us as faculty members when we uh, have an innate uh, desire to do service um, when it comes to the tenure and promotion process? Uh, the dissatisfaction continues, so there's a lack of critical mass, there's a, uh, the structural diversity or the numbers uh, that we see. Sometimes they're, uh, they're not there, so you feel isolated. Um, some of the literature calls it the lonely or the only lonely. Uh, there's a lack of formal mentorship. Again, you know, in the, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, the socialization process for faculty really starts in graduate school and it kind of submits once you get into the academy. So um, a lack of formal mentorship, um, salary inequity, undervaluation of research interests, um, and the theoretical framework. So uh, going back to being challenged, um, who has the ability to create knowledge, the epistemology? Mm -hmm. um, is the research that we do, is it marginalized? Is it, all, is it on the margins? Uh, and then there's um, unrealistic expectations. So if you are the underrepresented, if you are the minority, if you are the faculty of color, uh, perhaps you are designated to a committee to serve on a committee to, to be that representative. And again, that uh, kind of puts uh, some faculty members in a double bind, if you will. And um, some more literature re review, and this has to deal with uh, the service learning contributions. Uh, faculty socialization, again, it starts very early in graduate school, and according to the literature with service learning, so we kind of melded the two, service learning and also uh, diversity. Uh, and it looked at um, some of the characteristics that impact why faculty do what they do, especially as it relates to service learning. Uh, some of it has to do with the organizational culture, uh, the agency. Uh, we see high levels of stress among women and also uh, among faculty of color, LGBT faculty, 
Um, and also, we, we see more service opportunities with those who have lower rank. Uh, so this is important. And also, the gender um, has a lot to do with that as well. Student engagement. Um, over the, I think over 30 years, there's been, uh, Emily shared an article with me, so there's been a disengagement with students uh, in service learning over the past 30 years or so. Um, but there are benefits to students doing service learning, and those benefits are outlined. They, you know, their leadership uh, skills are, are developed. Uh, they have uh, interest in attaining uh, higher educational attainment, so attending graduate schools, and they persist. Uh, and also, there's a reduction in negative stereotypes. So you talk about that interactional diversity. Once students began to uh, kind of um, interact with different communities, so you kind of you minimize those stereotypes, and then the institutional impact. And I thought thought that when I was reading the articles, uh, that this statement was it. It really kind of impacted me. So as long as most service activities are practiced by marginalized faculty, these activities will remain on the margins in the academy. And so this really left me with, um, with a couple of observations here. I'm going to have to speed through that one. So I just wondered, uh, it, when it comes to the recruitment, retention, and success of faculty, so I just asked the question, how do we support faculty through this process? Um, and then, so we'll look at the formation of, of, uh, of the writing group at ODU. And these are some of the numbers. But I want to highlight. These numbers right here are very important. And these are the, the colleges um, at, here at the university. And you'll see that in the College of Arts and Letters, um, our diverse faculty, um, arts and letters lead with uh, black faculty or African American faculty at 16. OK, so again, you may be able to see some of that stress or maybe some of that isolation that goes along with being in those yellow boxes. Uh, the College of Business. Asian Pacific Islander, so they lead with about 32 minority. And th this information came from HR. So the, the term minority here, this is the word that they gave me, but the US Department of Education, so they use a whole different category. Because if I were to look at this, I would probably take Asian and Pacific Islander out. And those numbers would actually decrease even more. And then the College of uh, Continuing Educational and Professional Development, that's a pretty much, it's a new college, but it's also homogenous. Uh, education leads. Uh, with minority faculty, um, African American with 11 in the English, or engineering, I'm sorry. Uh, they have 37 of Asian and Pacific Islander. And then um, in health sciences, they lead with black faculty um, at nine. So I think context is important because even when we look at our student population, we have a 52 percent uh, Caucasian student population, 26 percent African American, and so forth and so on. And so I think that this context is important because when you meld the two, you wonder if we have men, women and faculty of color and LGBT doing most of service learning activities, who's going to hold these students, not accountable, but, but how do you move service learning from the margins to the center if only a few faculty are doing that? So this is why the context is important. And this is our um, timeline. We're moving right into uh, the development of the writing group. So in May, I made it to the institution. May the 10th was my uh, one-year anniversary. So I met with Chandra De Silva, and I actually met with him about the core two initiative, so committing our resources to excellence through equity. And so again, it looked at the recruitment, retention, and success of faculty uh, at the university. He re and I pitched to him my idea, some of the ideas that I wanted to, uh, to kind of implement at the university. He recommended me to. Ramika uh, Bingham Risher, I met with her. Uh, they had a, a new and upcoming faculty writing studio. It was still up. It looked like something off of a, uh, what's the home like depot? Pottery barn or something. <laughs> <laughs> so it was still, in, in, they were still Renovation. building it. They, like home, what's the name of it? Fix this house or something. Oh, no. <laughs> HGTV, like it looked like okay. something off of HGTV. So they were, they were still working on it. Um, so I pitched to her my idea. She told me about the goals of the, of the center. And we figured out that it was, a, you know, it was a pretty good fit. And so I had, we had about three months in there to plan what exactly this writing group would look like. So I started to look at uh, what other institutions were doing. I started to look at um, 
you know, what our overall objectives were and how you build uh, the, the curriculum, what the articles would look like. So we met with some of the, the co-presenters. So I look for co-presenters, like for instance, with our schedules, I think someone mentioned about schedule. So if I was not able to be there, uh, one of the co-presenters, uh, so we, we knew every bi-weekly life what we were going to do. Um, and so that was very helpful. So we had about three months to plan. Um, it went out, we had very limited slots. There were eight slots available. And we started in September, hitting the ground running. And some of the information that we found out in the literature, it could be quite frightening because it's, it goes back to the article of the 20 uh, years of research that um, I think it was Gonzalez, Woods, and somebody else, Turner. Uh, Turner, what they found. And so we were actually able to see that, talk about tips and theory into practice. When we started to talk, and we started to share some of the some of our narratives. Uh, we we found some of that, uh, but we met uh, one and a half hours biweekly, and we carved out that time. Uh, and those were some of the topics that we discussed. We talked about everything from uh, the Carnegie classification. How do you fit? Uh, we we talked about interdisciplinary research. So we pulled the strategic plan and looked at the direction that the university was going in. And again, making that visible. You know what we don't know sometimes can hurt us. We were all on very different tracks, um, but we talked about, we even had a full member, is he a full professor now? Mm -hmm. He went up, I think, yeah, I think he got He it. went up for a full, full professor, professor yeah. so uh, he came and he talked about CVs, what CVs should look like, so again, that conocimiento and exchanging that knowledge. Uh, and then we didn't stop there, so after each session, we had writing prompts to help us process, because it could be quite scary, you could see it on our faces. Like, are we gonna make it? <laughs> so you could see it, but we didn't wanna stay there. We wanted to move everyone forward. And so uh, in January, we went into like action oriented, okay? And we met still for an hour and a half, but instead of biweekly, it was monthly. So we had like an accountability structure. So we came back, talked about our goals, talked about some of the barriers uh, that kept us from writing. Uh, and then uh, we would talk about set, set goals. So, and then, and this was an eye toward uh, publication or presenting at a conference like this. You know, this is our nine months, so we're pushing now, we're giving birth. We're even talking about writing an article mm -hmm. about the model, and we want to disseminate it, uh, but as a result of the productivity, of, as a result of being together over the nine months, uh, we've had conference presentations, uh, we've had uh, guest editors, um, we've had um, people who have reviewed manuscripts and um, submitted manuscripts. And this is what our demographic looked like. And, and so we had uh, three co-facilitators at those different levels. Uh, we had uh, going back to the, to the yellow boxes again, so we can see where our representatives came from, arts and letters, education, engineering, and health sciences. Uh, race and gender, fall semester we had five African-American females, two Hispanic males, one white female. And Christine, I remember when she first walked in the group, she said, uh, can I come? <laughs> so I will say that the biggest, I think one of the challenges that Ramika and I that we had was to market something for a targeted group that would benefit all of the institution. So I think that that was, that was a challenge for us, but we, we came up with the content, and so that's how we came up with the, uh, with the title. So Christine, when she came in, I was like, you're underrepresented, you may, <laughs> you know, so of course anyone can come to yeah. the, come to the group. Uh, but then in spring semester, we experienced a bit of attrition because of structural, you know, re sometimes department meetings, uh, switch, and you know, they'll share some of that. Um, but we had some attrition, uh, and you can see the ranks. We had everyone from administrators to also uh, professors at, at different levels, and then we had about a 62 percent uh, attrition rate. And so those are some of the lessons that we learned, accountability. Um, and it really, uh, uh, it was a, a self-sustaining structure because I didn't want to go on Wednesdays and not report anything. I don't know about <laughs> right. being the slacker's corner. But you know what? Sometimes it was okay to be because you had that support. Like someone said, I don't know if I'm contributing or I don't know if this is an effective technique, but this is what I've heard. Mm -hmm. uh, so we still exchange. Even if we had difficulty, we still exchange that information. And then community. Uh, being that torchbearer, you know, uh, being able to say, and I think one of the issues with community is once as new faculty you come out from under the wings of your dissertation chair, part of the difficulty I think is developing your own professional identity uh, apart from that. So that, that can be part of, uh, you know, kind of developing that community as well. Motivation, I think we used to, uh, life does not ask our permission to happen, it just happens. And over the nine months that we were together, Life happened, so we were able to support each other outside of the classroom uh, and um, 
just emotional support of each other. And it could be because we're females. I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but we developed, I think, a, se a, a sense of self-efficacy. Like, we are, com we are contributing not only to the university, but to the Carnegie classification and to our discipline. And sometimes coming out of dissertation writing, again, developing that professional identity, sometimes can be difficult. Uh, the structure, we had a structured space time, a designated time, and it was on our calendars, uh, can I think to, uh, to someone's point out in the audience. And um, I think time constraints, and we all kind of suffered, like, I think, with time constraints, uh, just trying to manage and trying to balance the research, teaching, and the service. So now I have talked, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, and then we'll uh, hear from them, and, and they'll talk about uh, bridging this theory into practice. So. Um, just one thing I wanted to add to what Stephanie was sharing is that um, in the spring semester, we actually would meet and write together. So in the fall, we met and developed community, and we read the articles, discussed the articles, talked about barriers. Um, and I think that was important to develop the community structure and the support network. But in the spring, we did maybe 10, 15 minutes of that. And then the rest of the hour or so, we would um, bring our laptops and write. So our, I would say my take is that our goal was to move from community development, discussing the issues, um, developing tips, supporting each other, into action in the spring. So I know sometimes when we talk about groups like this, I've heard people are concerned, well, are people just talking and not doing anything? And our goal <clears throat> here was to get things done. Um, and I'll just share really quickly. I actually forgot to tell you, but I had two book chapters published in the spring semester. I had one peer-reviewed journal article that I submitted. Um, let's see, I'm conducting two studies, a qualitative research study and a quantitative research study. So in the fall, I was very new here and getting used to Old Dominion, getting to know people in my department, in the university. Um, so I feel like I was sort of slower in that process, but I think that this group, I can attribute um, part of um, <clears throat> ramping up to the support of this group, to having a place that was a safe space where I could just go and talk about <clears throat> what I was doing successfully and the things that were challenging for me. Um, and you know, you're right, when I came I wasn't sure it was exactly <laughs> the right group for me, but <clears throat> honestly it's one of the greatest things that I've done since, I've, um, since I came to Old Dominion. So that's my quick blurb. Um, coming from a background in community college, my focus was, of course, just on teaching and service. I didn't have, uh, I guess, an opportunity to publish as much. And then with my background in community health, um, I just simply wrote proposals all the time for grant funds. And of course, manuscript writing is very different from proposal writing. And no matter how many times people tell you they're pretty much the same, they're not. So when I got here, I wanted to make sure that I took advantage of all of the resources that Old Dominion has to offer. So I met with uh, Liz Saltzman over in the Office of Research, and I also had her to come and speak to um, a couple of my classes. But I wanted her to give me some direction on taking all of my grant writing experience and turning that into um, an opportunity for me to, you know, focus on more manuscript writing. And so I had to make myself a little more um, competitive now. And I think this group provided me that encouragement that I needed because, you know, sitting in your departmental meetings, you just hear about your colleagues. Oh, yeah, I got that million dollar grant. It was no problem. <laughs> oh, yeah, we had 15 articles published this year. And you're sitting there thinking, oh, my goodness, where do I fit in here? And so when I would meet with my colleagues um, in the writing group, I got a lot of encouragement. Um, we would um, not only motivate one another to write during the period when we were together, but sometimes also to step out of our box. So we've you know, taken on different roles. Um, I've got an opportunity to um, be a guest editor for journals. So just things that I, I wouldn't have done um, unless these guys had encouraged me to do that. And then also, um, I stepped back into my student self and I reached out to my previous mentors because a lot of my colleagues were pretty much busy with their own work. 
and they wouldn't always have time for a junior faculty member. Um, now, a, a lot of them did, but of course they would want you to have a majority of the work already done. So if you're going to them uh, to have them review something for you, you need to pretty much have it all together and, and they'll give you a couple of minutes. Uh, and sometimes that can be frustrating too. So I had to step back into my student self, reach out to some of my mentors. And um, luckily enough, uh, we did have some publications with my, my mentors. Uh, but I think all of the efforts that um, Old Dominion as a whole is making for uh, mentorship opportunities for junior faculty members to work with seasoned faculty members and opportunities like um, Center for Learning and Teaching and definitely our faculty writing group, it really makes a difference for junior faculty members. Um, it can be a little overwhelming sometimes. You know, your department brings you in for the expertise that you have, but when you're sitting amongst your colleagues, you really feel like you're sitting at the table with nothing to offer. You don't see the good that you bring to the mm -hmm. to the table. You really don't don't feel that all the time. And so, I think with having these kinds of resources that are made available to us and encouraging one another to take advantage of those kinds of resources that it really helps to develop us um, overall. And then also reaching out to another uh, faculty member too. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you don't always think you have something to offer uh, someone else, you know, but you do. And sometimes it's just an encouraging word. And also when we're trying to put together our schedules, I know I simply say I write on Fridays and Sundays and those are my days. But at the same time with having a young and active family, I miss out on things. I miss out on some games. I miss out on some other activities. But it's because I'm trying to um, work towards something else. So it's almost like a, a give and take. And you know, you really have to pencil in that time for just writing. Um, I, re I can remember being at a tenure and promotion um, session that was hosted by the provost. And she said, when you set aside your writing time, you really have to be serious about it. Um, you can't be answering the phone and answering email. You have to block that time out. And when I first got here, it was that was difficult to do. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you have to envision yourself sitting in your, your lecture uh, for those three hours and not concentrate on anything but writing. Wow. Um, I, I hope I don't uh, copy too much of what everyone else already said. I came into the writing group um, via a QEP workshop. I um, am a joint lecturer in the Departments of Sociology and Criminal Justice, and I'm on a non-tenure track. And so having a PhD in a non-tenure track, my goal was always still to maintain my research. Um, often teaching a 4-4, it becomes very difficult to do that. Um, and so most of my classes that I teach are upper level. They're cross-listed with political science, African-American studies, and sociology. And I was teaching a writing intensive course. And I wanted to continue my own writing as I'm encouraging students to develop and be more particular about their writing using rubrics and things like that. And I was able to take the QEP workshop with Ramika. And um, I guess a couple of weeks after the workshop, she called and was like, hey, we're trying to put this faculty um, writing group of color together. Um, and I think you would be a perfect co-facilitator. And so immediately my anxiety kicked in and I'm like, I'm not even publishing yet. Like I'm, I just got an article done, but I don't have time, a young active family. I was like, I don't think I'm the right person. And she was like, no, I really do think you should really meet with Stephanie. And once we met, I think the initial meeting was 20 minutes and we got so, like we had the whole outline of what we were gonna do for the semester. Um, so that was really encouraging. And then once we started the group to hear all the different ranks of professors, all the different ranks of colleges come together and share similar anxieties that I think at one of the QEP workshops, we were, somebody mentioned the anxiety of whether or not you think you can write well. And this is a room full of PhDs who all took their summer vacation off to join a writing, I mean, this is Nerd Life Central. And everyone was saying, <laughs> I don't think my writing is good enough, I'm not sure. I, and so to be in that space and then to hear those same themes, almost what Christine is saying, to be mimicked and repeated um, in this group with feeling like you know you have something to offer, you know you're here because you have a special knowledge or value or because you teach well, but to still see other professors and other uh, faculty members and staff struggle with 
making the time to write, but also the quality of their writing um, and seeing your writing as valuable. So I think that our, our um, workshops kind of follow the theme of like national trends, community, and then personal narratives. And it was really affirming to me to read some of the national trends, particularly like concepts like other mothering and things that like faculty of color or um, f uh, f um, women um, uh, faculty members suffer with over mentoring and like always making time for students. And I know I, I have that challenge, particularly if you're in a small discipline. Uh, African American studies um, major is really small, and so you, I teach most of the foundation classes, I know most of the students, and if you're a first generation student like myself, and a first generation faculty member, you tend to have a line. People wanna talk to you, people wanna talk about their problems, and they're not all academically related. And so for me, this group helped me to, I started Skyping um, you know, students a little more, I started doing telephone conferences, as opposed to the face-to-face -face ongoing meetings that last for hours that you don't have. Um, and I think that in addition to what someone said in terms of just taking the time to write every day or whatever, I don't have that habit. And so I tend to wait for the five hour break. And then you, you know, it, it's interesting because we, th we talked about a lot of the same things we do. Like I tend to revise over and over and over before I get to the next paragraph. And so to kind of see what other people's process was and to be accountable to have a certain number of things done by this date really um, helped me. I, I hope I'm not forgetting. Oh, but I also think that this, this space allowed us the opportunity to identify what you're writing in a way that affirms your, your sexuality, your ethnicity, your race, and then not to be something seen as not valued. Um, because oftentimes when you are a woman of color or you are studying complex issues or issues of social justice, people assume that that's gonna be your position and this is why it'll be your position, as opposed to being having an uh, emotionally detached or quantitative back to reason and philosophy for your beliefs. So I think that this, hearing other people's story helped me to uh, really commit to my story, my narrative, and to commit to my writing and, and, and I guess fuller detail and knowing that it's going to be appreciated somewhere and that we have the ability to collaborate. I think that this really helped me seeing how collaborations across campuses can help more. We tend to have, we have structural diversity in our department, meaning we have several members of, particularly female faculty members of color, but it doesn't necessarily translate into inclusion or sharing of ideas or, and so it was really nice to come in this group and immediately feel like a camaraderie and like a shared, hey, let's do this together in a way where I don't necessarily reach out to my department members in that way. So it was really helpful for me. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and I'll go back to that, that torch bearer. So there were some days that I came in and I felt like the one that was on the ground. <laughs> there were other days that I came in and even hearing their nervous where I thought, okay, they're passing nuggets, you know, that intellectual capital. So I felt like the woman that was on the stallion. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, maybe, it, so it was kind of an ebb and flow there. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate uh, the, the level of professionalism and, you know, just the experience that you brought to the group. So thank you for that. Um, and we have about five minutes left. But I just wanted to briefly talk about some of the implications um, of the group. And I think when you have faculty of color, underrepresented, minority, when they are in the pipeline, it helps with student retention. It helps with uh, student recruitment and retention mm -hmm. and success with academic achievement. It also helps with liaising with communities of color, okay, especially when you have communities of color that may be very insular. Um, and it also, just like we exchange knowledge, so it affirms to communities of color that they are active in making knowledge and that they are participants in their own history and sometimes depending upon class depending upon where the community is uh, sometimes people can be dismissed so they're not heard uh, but when you have faculty members who understand that and go into communities uh, they're able to translate that also i think writing groups uh, create an awareness it promotes uh, diversity and inclusion and also minimizes the stereotypes just like that of, of students uh, it creates community. So you have a sense of belongingness. And if I could say one word, it would be that sense of uh, sense of belonging. You minimize your isolation from the dissertation process onward. It's really a, a, an event of solitude. You write in solid, in, like not in solidarity, but <laughs> like isolation. Mm -hmm. So to have a group once again to say, hey, you know what? I don't have it all together. I don't know exactly what I'm doing here as a first generation faculty member, but we're gonna give it a try. Um, and then I think it takes a paradigm shift. 
about, again, who has the ability to create knowledge, what knowledge is important, and how we, um, because the research says that sometimes when faculty come into the academy and they find out that their research interest does not align with that of the institution or a Carnegie classification, they switch the research agenda. Mm -hmm. They switch the research agenda. So I think from this perspective, it's important because you kind of snuff the innovation, and we we're talking about research creativity, so you don't have that anymore because we're trying to fit in. We're trying to you know, assimilate into the, into the academy. And then it fosters faculty development, retention, success, student engagement, and it promotes a culture of success. That self-efficacy is critical because there are in the ivory tower, uh, whether we want to believe it or not, there's still conversations about people not feeling their contributions matter to the ivory um, tower, uh, but but they do. So, and this is what this group has done uh, for me. So, here we go. Time for Q and A. Mm -hmm. Our job is done. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yay. Okay. Let me think if I can put this together the right way. So you talked a lot about faculty as faculty in the classroom. That's their primary role. But how, how might you incorporate or do you incorporate faculty administrators whose primary role on campus is administration, but who still might have an interest in not because it's required for their continued success in the job, mm -hmm. but their interest in research and contributing to the academy and all those kinds of things. Because I feel like I'm in that place. I just finished a second master's in communication and writing my thesis was a interesting endeavor. Um, and a group would have been really helpful to help kind of motivate me to do it. So I had to rely a lot on my advisor and then I found that when he gave me like, you have to have everything written by this date, yeah. I went, ah, and I took a week of vacation so that I could write. But it was really hard because you're not only balancing just your work, your full-time work on campus, but home and all these other kinds of things that are pulling at your time. And so how, what's the future for, I guess, faculty administrators who aren't, whose primary function isn't teaching. Mm -hmm. Can I just add one? So one thing I wanted to share that I was amazed by is we had an associate dean who joined our group too. I think she's associate. Um, so she's primarily, I think, an administrator. Mm -hmm. So what I liked about our group is that we had that diversity of work too. We had people who were new, tenure track. You know, we mentioned um, lecturer. We had people who were probably doing more administrative work. So it basically, I, my feeling is that this kind of group can function for whoever is in the group. Mm -hmm. So, and I think part of what we did in the fall is we laid out what our actual whole, and it's very holistic. I'm, my interest is in holistic approaches to mental health. So I like holism. So I felt like in the fall, we sort of, as we built community, we were able to share about what our whole lives were like, not just, mm -hmm the life we're supposed to be showing everybody as right. faculty true. members. Yeah. So and I think that's the part of the safe space that was helpful. We didn't have to front anything. We mm -hmm. can kind of say, okay, so we have children and we have all these demands or we have, we're, I have to work like two full-time jobs now because there's, you know, someone left. So kind of the actual realities of our lives. And we also tried to find ways to help each other to be successful with all those challenges. So if you want to add. No, and, and if you look here with the, the rank, uh, we had administrators, uh, assistant director, associate director, assistant dean, uh, as well as professors along every, every rank. So I think that that add to the intersectionality of experiences within the group. And so what we didn't know is new faculty of, you know, first generation faculty coming into the ivory tower, uh, someone who was moving from an associate to a full professor was able to share. And so I think, again, that transfer of knowledge. Uh, but it could, be, it could be that we need to look at the marketing of it, because, you know, for faculty of color. So that may, um, 
may imply that administrators cannot join, but mm -hmm. it's most, you know, it is open uh, to administrators. But that's an excellent, uh, that's an excellent observation. I'll come out or, or ask a question that might not even be your philosophy. Um, I'm very much, I guess I've learned through the process, I'm very much a social writer. So meaning you do write in uh, isolation, but if I'm accountable to you and I've promised you, you know, my half an article or something by a due date. So I um, appreciate your model um, of working together and see how that might work for me. And then this is the part where I'm sure you might would say, okay, well, hour and a half that we've devoted every other week, is that how often mm -hmm. you meet? In the Has fall. maybe paid, you've saved time that way. What if I can't envision even giving up that three hours a month right this second? Is there any other way to sort of have a half of a community or a support system that doesn't um, require me to make that commitment that I can't even envision right this minute? I think, too, the use of like, new technologies, yeah. because I know that initially this was not gonna be a nine month process. It was a fall semester. So I was like, oh, I set my schedule for fall. And then when we had the community and all the momentum was going, we were like, oh, let's continue in the spring. But my spring schedule wasn't as conducive as my fall. And so um, I think that even the email communication saying, hey, we're meeting, even if I knew I couldn't meet that meeting in my mind, it was like, I still should be writing. And so I, I kind of think that we have other media technologies, even if it's just we're all going to be in a blog and share what we did, or I'm going to email you this section, can you review it? You, I, I think that this would be very conducive to even if you can't physically be present, even if you only have 30 minutes to write. Because sometimes even if you have an hour and a half, for the first hour, you might be like, uh, uh you know, sometimes that's how I, I just redo. So I think that, I think, I think this group is fluid enough and flexible enough to say, um, you know, whatever you can give, you can give. And there was people who were there in the fall, like Orlando's in the next workshop, and he's in engineering, and he still talked about how it benefited him. And even though he didn't come in the fall semester at all, he still was talking about how it helped his writing and how he produced. And so I, you know, I think that if you have an initial meshing of community, and sh then it, I think that that helps to navigate in any kind of new medias that may you can move forward. That's my thoughts. Yeah, and I, I created. Oh. I created um, a writing outline for myself. And I just, it's almost like a log of all of the questions that um, my mentors would ask me when they would review my work and my former dissertation committee. Any of the questions they would ask me, I would group those into subcategories. So even if I wasn't in the mood for just sitting and writing narratives, I would go back into that log of questions and try to answer as many of them as possible, even if not in complete sentences, just with word phrases. But again, putting in that hour and a half worth of work. And I would say once we began the community, no one was kicked off the island, mm -hmm. even if they did not, if they were not with us spring semester. But I see Orlando all around mm -hmm. campus. Yeah. And I mean, it's just, it's the camaraderie to know that we don't have the imposter syndrome. You know, mm -hmm. we don't have to fake that. I mean, that's in the literature. But so many times we do do that in the in the academy because of the the context. Uh, but just to see a familiar face and say, you know, you understand or you can sympathize with what it is that I'm I'm going through as a new faculty, you know, uh, a first generation faculty member in the academy. So no one's kicked off the aisle. And I think you raise a good point. Um, so and I'm slow to really jump into all the technology, but I can really see. I mean, I guess my question would be about the development of community part, like, but let's put that over here. I think you could have like an email group kind of thing or like a blog or something where it's um, asynchronous, mm -hmm. where you have mm -hmm. sort of a community that, you, that works for you where you can check in. And again, part of what we did in the second part was setting goals and checking in. So I'm gonna, you know, spend four hours. Did you do it? Did you not? You know, if you did, yay, and you get the support. If you didn't, well, let's try to troubleshoot as to how you can be more successful in the next step. So, I mean, I, we haven't really discussed that, but I think that there are creative ways of using technology where you don't have to actually bring your body to a certain place at a certain time. Because I know, I mean, I, I mean, professional adults, it is really hard to get the schedules together to do that. The other thing I, I did just realized is 
we met at lunchtime, so I mean, if you're, you, we have to eat. So none of us brought our lunch, though. I just realized that we never did that. But um, so I mean, that would be another thing too. If you're going to take even a half hour, have lunch, sit, check in, mm -hmm. and then go back to a meeting or whatever you need to do. I just want to add really quick that I think it also helped me develop the out of the box skills. Like I know that from this group, I'm now even in this workshop, I'm more now like, hi, what's your name? What do you do? You know, what what um, what department are you in? Maybe we can collaborate on something. And I, that was definitely not my persona prior to being in this group. I think it's a lot easier for me to um, introduce myself and see potential collaborations across departments in, in ways that I wouldn't have before. And I think it's just knowing that other people have similar you know, concerns and issues. And so I definitely think that it helped me to skill build a little bit better even moving forward. Any more questions? All right, we'll wrap up here. Thank you so very much, our panelists. And thank you, everyone. If you can just fill out the evaluation form and give it back to me, that will be great. And we have handouts if anyone is interested. Should we just take it to the table? Thank mm -hmm. you.